it's really cool the family and we've got putting this all together. It's really, really nice uh, to see B sides spreading all across Europe. Even if the country I told you is not going to be in that I'm, I'm Steve, I'm from the, from the UK, the, the formerly sixth largest economy in the world. And by the time I get back, if I've got any euros left over, I'll get a pay off on all these. Most people who know of me know of me on Twitter for the talks. So um, normally my avatar is naked. Thankfully, I am not. <laughs> and. Um, other than that, I, I kind of do pen testing for a living. I've been doing it for 16 years. Uh, it's getting a old, to be honest, but um, I still find stuff, so it's all interesting things that keep up the streets. I co organised a little conference called 44 Common London, um, which has been running since 2011. Um, and I have a blog on pen testing and a mailing list to try and help people learn how to pen test well, because there's a lot of people coming into the market who say, I want to be a pen tester, and they go off and do it, and they go and join large companies that effectively treat them you know, like a sausage factory, just putting people through and grinding them up and spitting them out. So I try to encourage people to run the pen test properly. But this talk isn't anything to do with pen testing. This talk is about something that my friends and I do. So a couple of years ago, I started looking at in the Internet of Things. And I like to think of the Internet of Things as a series of solutions and mental problems. And if you've ever seen the Internet of Things, you might have seen the problem related to the Internet of Things. So this, for example, is smart plate. What is smart plate? Smart plate is tracked by science. What does smart plate do? It's tracked by science. That's all you need to know. Smart plate will tell you what you eat. I have another tool to tell you what I eat. It's called my eyes. These are smart socks. The, they actually, the, the smart socks themselves come with a widget that you plug onto your phone and there's an app. And the socks that you buy from them have got these little chips in that tell them how many times they've been washed. So they can measure black metals to make sure that you've got properly black socks. They'll tell you when your socks need to be washed and when your socks need to be replaced. Again, eyes. Uh, my rule for socks is that if I throw it against the wall and it sticks, it's probably good for another week. <laughs> if I throw it against the wall and it screams and tries to run away, watch time. <laughs> and then the final thing I want to show you is um, the Eggminder, whose company name I forget. But the people who designed the Eggminder got funding for it and they couldn't find a use case for it. <laughs> so they didn't actually know why you would want to have something that tells you how fresh your eggs are in your fridge via an app and sends you alerts to say, eggs are going up. Um, and I think it was actually LG ended up buying them, and they made millions out of it. So, if you look at the IoT market, it's kind of a lot like this. It's a lot of people selling snake oil, all arguing at all, saying that their stuff is great, without really knowing what value it adds to humanity. But if we look at where, if we take IoT aside, we look at what's under the hood, most of the time you have a widget, and that widget is a device that's built on a system chip module. And what we can do is we can do some pretty evil things with system chip modules. So we can take off-the-shelf kit, and we can take maker kit, and we can do some bad things. And this talk isn't really about doing bad things, because in my country, aside from having no economy, we also have a set of really bad laws about hacking. And I don't really know about you, but I know I'm the prettiest guy in the world, but his face is too pretty for prison. But what if we were to mix hacking and the quality control of the Internet of Things what we could do is we could create the Internet of Wrongs. <laughs> and this is something I've been exploring over the past couple of years, looking at IoT devices, and I've brought some things today that I've built. Some out of household objects that you can re re uh, you know, re reuse, and some stuff that is built using make a kit from scratch. And I'll, I'll walk you through some of these devices. And later on, we'll do a workshop where we'll, we'll go through one class of sort of hardware-ish type stuff you can do without actually having to know any electronics. So none of the things that I'm going to talk about today are actually very good. In fact, you may well feel a bit cheated by the end of this talk. But they are all things that you can pick up without prior knowledge. And if you read between the lines, what I'm not telling you about is the stuff that's actually quite cool that you can do these things. So I'm going to start with my failed attempt to move to Germany. Now, 
I imagine there's probably not necessarily going to be a huge amount of work for Germany in this room. Um, but I tried to move to Berlin a couple of years ago and failed miserably, mainly on the grounds that my German's not very good. But while I was flipping between the UK and Berlin, I stayed with my friend Dom. Now, this isn't Dom, this is a stock photo of, uh, it's meant to represent Dom's flatmate. And Dom's flatmate, let's call him Mark, um, was a very special kind of Berlin hipster. You see, when I met Mark, Mark had just bought a MacBook, and he insisted that Macs were the best thing ever. They were the ultimate personal computer. And you might think, okay, smart fanboy, fair enough, why? And the answer will surprise you, because it wasn't the operating system, it wasn't the hardware quality, it was the fact that he could go and wake up in the morning, bring his laptop to the breakfast table, have his breakfast, check the internet, read Facebook, shut the lid, go to work, come back home, open the lid, and it would be at 95%. And the reason for this is that he had a Lenovo that just had a ton of crackware on it and drained his battery. So Tom and I tried convincing him that power management is actually a thing, and he was having none of it. So we kind of thought, if he doesn't understand power management, can we educate him through the means of a polite, practical joke? So as I was flipping between the UK and Berlin quite a bit, I, um, I came back over to Dar's place and I brought with me some toys. And I said, oh, right, okay, well, there's, there's lots of things we can do. We can go and take his MacBook apart. We can go and try and do something to some of the chips on there, uh, do something cool. Or we can install a UEFI binary that will have a keylogger on it and we can reconfigure it so that whenever he enters certain keystrokes, it so shuts the computer down or it'll turn off power saving or it'll do something cool. And we kind of thought, if we open up a MacBook and it breaks, it's not a very good practical joke. So then we thought, why don't we go and put some malware on the device? You know, and then that way, wherever he goes, what we can do is we can just have it randomly do stuff to switch off. And again, if we kind of screw that up, that's not really a nice thing for him. So in the end, we decided to go and look at Wake on Man. So Wake on Man is a very simple protocol, and somehow, despite there being a standard for it, most people don't adhere to it. So what you have is you have what the concepts of something called a magic packet. And there's Wake on Land and Wake on Wireless Land and various forms of Wake on this and that. But OSX in particular requires that packet to be on UDP port 9. It's a very simple data center. You send it to a broadcast IP or MAC address um, with a stream of apps at the start and then the target MAC address you want. And the actual Wi-Fi card on the device at the other end picks this up, not the operating system, because the operating system is turned off or on the main port turned off. And this is what the packet looks like in wire charts, and you can see it's actually, it, there's nothing particularly spectacular to it, but I just thought, well, I had an Arduino with me, and I had this little uh, TC3000 uh, Texas Instrument Wi-Fi breakout. And I thought it would just be a good excuse to use that. I kind of thought, if we go and start sending wake on land requests to Mark's laptop after we've gone to work, then obviously it will die before you get to it. So, so to make something like this, you're going to need an Arduino Uno. Uh, you can use a Nano, you can just use an Atmel chip if you prefer, but probably if you're going to do something like this from scratch, you want to use an Arduino Uno, he's going to do it um, using an Arduino. I would, if I was going to redo this, I would use um, an ESP8266 chip and a Wi-Fi coin. But you can get an Arduino Uno phone for about 10 euros um, and a TICC3000 shield because when it comes to Arduino, every device that you add onto it has its own set of libraries and its own way of doing things, and it's not always the same. Um, and that's about 35 euros, certainly, which is why if I was going to do this again from scratch, I'd use an ESP, because the ESP is about 5 euros. Um, and that's what the device looks like when it's powered on. And if you want to go and produce the software, then all you need is the Arduino IDE and the Adafruit CC3000 library. Um, again, different devices, uh, different hardware add ons, different Arduino shields, they call them, that things are not, um, have different libraries. If you've never used Arduino before, it basically uses a superset of C um, to kind of make it a bit more friendly. And there are two main functions there's the setup function which is where you generally configure your hardware, your pins, and what you're doing in there. And then there's a loop function, which unsurprisingly loops forever. So this is the code, and the code's available on my GitHub, which I probably should have put a link to, but it's 
GitHub slash Steve Ball um, and it's used for Walter because someone already had a body uh, for a web yeah. tool. And I'll just walk through some of this stuff. So what we have here is uh, we have our C headers at the top and all the users can call the best client. Okay. We set up the pins uh, for the shield and then we have the basic garbage Wi-Fi network the password which is provided and the security type. In the setup part, what we do is the CC3000 is designed for building IoT devices. Um, it expects to have an active point setup and an app that you can connect to its Wi-Fi network, put in the details, it saves the profile, restarts the device, connects to the network, which is a common IoT pattern. So we don't want to do that. We're going to get rid of all connection profiles that are there and then connect to the Wi-Fi network. And then in the loop function, uh, because I'm a pretty terrible programmer, I'm afraid of everything out of those functions, uh, the Wi Fi statements just print some details while I was debugging. And one me is the, the full cleaning effect. So you've got your sync stream, target MAC addresses, the CC3000 library has some really weird stuff in terms of the format that it expects, so you can't just use straightforward you know, um, standard socket functions or anything like that. And then um, we connect, we put the packet, we send it, and that's it. So far, so good, right? So, very simple wake on land sender. It sends wake on land every few seconds. Mark goes to work, his laptop stays awake, he comes home, laptop's dead. Me and Dom have a little chuckle, and then we tell him that the power management is the thing. And we actually kind of expected from Mark something like that. <coughs> Because he really hated that one, <coughs> and he really loves his man. Unfortunately, life has a habit of getting in the way of things. So I didn't get this working until the day before I was heading back to the UK, and I was supposed to come back two weeks later and stay over at Dom's again. The week after I left, Dom had a family emergency and had to go back to the UK, and Dom and I sort of didn't really see each other for about six months. In the meantime, this thing was going off in Dom's flat, keeping that MacBook awake. <laughs> so what happened? Well, Mark went to the Apple store, <laughs> and he said, I have a problem. My laptop keeps dying on me. So the Apple store took a look, and they said, we can't find a problem with it. We can find it. So Mark went home, and his MacBook. Done. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, getting fed up with it, goes to the Apple store and says, I have a problem, my MacBook keeps dying. So they're like, okay, all right, we'll keep it overnight, see how it does, right? So they keep it overnight, sure enough, power saving kicks in. Mark comes back the next day, there's nothing wrong with your MacBook. <laughs> Mark goes home. That book dies. <laughs> Apparently, in the first sort of month, he went back and forth a few times and pissed off the Apple Store um, in Berlin quite a lot. So he went back and he said, Look, I'm really serious about this. This keeps dying on me. What are you going to do about it? And they're like, We've had it overnight. Nothing's gone wrong. Where did you buy it from? He said, I bought it in Paris. It's like, we'll go to the Mac store in Paris <laughs> and get them to look at it. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever spent any time in Berlin, but it's a long trip to Paris by train and it's quite expensive. And it involves two of the worst rail networks in Europe. So, Mark went to the Apple store <laughs> in Paris <laughs> and he said, uh, excuse me, why? More MacBook than I have. My MacBook doesn't work. And they went, sure, sure. Okay, let's have a look. All right, doesn't look like there's anything wrong. I'll tell you what, we'll keep it in overnight. <laughs> Mark stayed at a youth hostel that night, not expecting to stay overnight, and went back the next day and it was fine. <laughs> so, six months after we had that in there, I go back and stay at Dom's. And, um, Mark, he sold the MacBook. I noticed he had a Dell. So I'm like, oh, you got a Dell? And he's like, no, no, I got a Dell. I'm like, what happened? He's like, oh, that MacBook was really shit. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. 
And then went and um, promptly took the uh, own bucket from, from Dark Bedroom. So some lessons learned from this whole thing. First of all, the CC33000 series modules are really expensive. It's not worth leaving them somewhere for six months. <laughs> uh, secondly, there's some sort of moral kind of thing I guess we could learn from all of this, which is that we should only use sort of you know malicious stuff for good. And if only I'd actually implemented some sort of command and control, I could have shut this off from back in the UK. Um, so that's the that's that's the story of the first device. I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, something that happened to me in Cape Town. Well, not even happened to me in Cape Town, it happened to my friend. I was flying out to Cape Town to go and see some friends, and they're really, really cool guys. Uh, Nick Giannetti, really good friends of mine. Uh, this obviously is not Nick Giannetti, but um, two people from Star Trek, so I suppose they're like them. So they're, they're pretty chill guys, and, and they live in this apartment block in Cape Town, an area called Newlands. And they have really, really, really crappy upstairs neighbors. Um, and while I was on the flight over there, out in the garden with my girlfriend chatting away, and um, all that happened was they were chatting about 8 o'clock in the evening. They're not being particularly loud or anything, just chilling out. Um, and the upstairs neighbors started shouting from the balcony from inside their apartment with the windows open. And he's the dude. And he's the guy. And he's the man and repeating this in kind of a really weird and sinister way. So when I got on the plane to fly out there, I thought everything was fine. By the time I landed, there'd been a fight, there'd been all kinds of stuff going on. So, you know, these are the takeaways of what we can learn from Eddie's neighbors about Eddie. That he is the dude, the guy, and the man, and that they kept repeating this over and over. So I said to Eddie, I mean, all right, okay, so how can we fuck with these guys? <laughs> <laughs> what option would be, because I had a Pi Zero on me, uh, is to go and write some code to deal with anyone connecting to the neighbor's Wi Fi. That would work. And then I remembered that I'm, I'd come back from New Zealand, uh, where I did a talk at KiwiCon about a thing called the Thunderblade that I built. So a Thunderblade is basically just a Raspberry Pi with a bit of Python code that will automatically deal based on DNS keywords. There's nothing particularly special to it, but it's it's a nice little thing to put together in an afternoon. Um, and the whole thing was the particular hipster-esque words when you see DNS packets going along, go and be all people. So we uh, we passed the DNS packet. This is the D packet library rather than Scappy. Anyone here ever use Scappy? Anyone here ever find it rather big and rather slow? Yeah, it, on a low power device, it's really tough to use Scappy for anything practical. D packet, on the other hand, is super duper quick, but obviously not as good for packet analysis as Scappy. And I, um, as evidenced by the fact that I did write some deal code in D packet, but it didn't really work very well, so I just used shout out to everybody. So I kind of thought I could build a Thunderblade and just have it so that instead of listening for requests, it just looks at whoever's on on uh, Jeff's network upstairs and deal with anyone over there. But then, as Eddie reminded me, I have a face that's too pretty for jail. So, instead, I said, why don't we build a device, which I'm gonna call football. Mainly because Eddie's neighbors are people. And what I used was, I used this, which is a known NCU device. Uh, the SP8266 chipset on there costs about a euro to two euros for the, the, for the chip, which is the one on. Well, this is a very basic breakout board called the SP1. Five euros for a known NCU. Um, just get it, program it with the Arduino IDE, and stick a battery pack on it. So, what comes out of the football? Quite clearly, crack over Grego to 11. And the process that I decided to use was to abuse some of the um, some of the functionality in the ESP to algorithmically generate SSIDs consisting of Jeff's the man, dude, or guy, plus an ID that was chosen at random, a two-digit ID, and broadcast them every 250 milliseconds. Because what 
well, obviously doing something malicious would be bad, like the awful people. Just insulting people over Wi-Fi SSIDs doesn't really break the law, does it? <coughs> so I want to go over to switch this thing on, and if you go on Wi-Fi, you should, if the demo gods are smiling on us. So if the demo gods are smiling, you should start to see SSID popping up. Now, a funny thing about the way Wi-Fi SSID broadcasts work, I had to put a delay in because only one device can talk on one channel at a time. And if you don't put a delay in, it floods that entire channel, thus blocking anybody from using it. <laughs> So why is this particularly better? So the ESP8266 uses a thing called the Espresso IFSTK, uh, which is integrated into our video if you set it up correctly. And for about a euro, we can do all kinds of naughty packet injection with the Wi-Fi send packet for you from now. Now, the people who invented the tool set for realized that some people were starting to abuse this and took it out. But the answer is just to use an old version of the SDK. Um, and what I'm not going to show you today is something I did with two ESPs, partly because it's a bit unstable and flaky, and partly because it's, it would probably be illegal. Um, which is two of these things. So for two euros, you have one ESP8266 device that scans for Wi Fi connections, and you have another one that sends DORs. But what you can also do is you can also use DOR floods to reset the WPS log down on some routers. There's a thing in WPA called Michael which says if there's loads of authentications and association failures to be created, then just basically shut down. So, some lessons learned. The ESP8266 is a platform that's certainly cheap, but it's not necessarily reliable. The SDK has a lot of memory limits. There's, you, you generally have to write code for a reset situation. Um, it's a fiddly platform, it's 3.3 volts when a lot of the stuff that I use is 5 volts. Um, so I end up always having to do stuff either on a Raspberry Pi or having to do stuff where I have to use Zines Dialogs to drop voltage. And then he's made with an asshole. <laughs> so meanwhile in the UK, um, anybody here ever played with SVRs? RTL, STL, yeah. So um, if you've ever done any radio stuff, you'll find that normally what you do is you have a giant antenna out the garden, and then you'll have a piece of coax cable running all the way into your house, and you'll have what's called a shack, which is basically a man cave with radio gear. And using a series of connectors, you plug it into the radio that you want to do your radio stuff. The problem with this is that um, the cable attenuates the signal. So you end up with signal loss because of the cable going from the antenna to your device. So a while ago I thought, well, okay, what if we use a cheap TV stick with a cheap pocket router and stick that right by the antenna and then stream stuff over wireless instead? And thus I built this. This is uh, a device that I have in my living room that's plugged into the TV area because British TV is terrible. Um, and I'd rather watch planes flying overhead. So, what's it made of? Um, it's made of a pocket router called a GLINET uh, 6416A. Um, this is a GLINET AR150, which is the device that replaces it. And uh, it's about 20 euro, apparently. Uh, and let's see if I've got one. Oh, there's, a, there's also an SDR at the other end, which is just a straight TV stick, which is about sort of five to ten euros. The GLRNet comes from a family of routers that use the AR nine three X chipset, which is really, really handy for doing things like uh, Wi Fi attacks and stuff. But it's also a very well documented chipset. It's done a lot of open WRT support and stuff, which is pretty cool. There's also um, 
a chip set that people can popular. So, for example, this device, which is about 20 pounds, so 25 euros. Um, the new two range of devices, they use the 5350F Ramen chipset, which is um, slightly odd compared to the AR9 PPO, but starting to become more prevalent. Not very good for Wi Fi, but is very good for battery life. So, if we want to build a Wi Fi SDR, and in the workshop, that's what I'm going to show you how to do and walk you through. Um, you install some OpenWRT firmware, you install some extra packages, and then you set up a command called RTLTTP to list on the socket, and then you connect it towards over the Wi Fi. And I was going to do uh, an SDR demo. <coughs> Actually, I will do. I'll just find my SDR. Uh, that's good. You get to see it when we uh, when I do the workshop later. But what I can do is I can go into the link into my home system. So what I've got on here is the device itself. Um, and obviously we're doing this from the other side of Europe. And I'm not going to be able to do the straight RTL stream over because it is a connection with PC slow. But I'll show you what it looks like in the workshop. Um, what I can show you, if I come over here, Planes that are flying over my house at the moment. So this is, this is in itself probably not incredibly interesting, but when you combine it with something like this, what you have is you have a portable device that you stick a cheap TV stick on and you can use to monitor planes within a range of around 150 kilometers. So this is London, this is Dorset, which is about say 150 kilometers away. That's Oxford, which is about maybe around something like 80 to 100 kilometers from Portsmouth, uh, maybe a bit more. So all of this area of the south of England is stuff that you can see in fact. Right, if you scratch up on A, that is far away. That's a, uh, I don't think we need jets to go there or something. Um, but we can see quite a large range of planes. And what we can do, because we can get the identifiers for these planes, we can see where these planes have been before and what they've done. So. If you were an enterprising person, perhaps talking to journalists about perhaps, say, flights by certain people within the European Union who have come to negotiate perhaps a particularly bad deal for Greece, <laughs> you could, hypothetically speaking, build one of these devices and then go and leave it anywhere within 150 kilometers of the airport and then pick it up when the battery comes out and start tracking where these flights have come from and which flight, full deck charter, has been taken. Uh, because the European Union does use its own charter to claim. But that's an exercise left for you. Because <laughs> I'm too pretty for jail. 
So why is it a wicked toy? Well, that's the obvious reason. But also, there are things that we can do. We have the full power of, of the SDR with us, which is not that great a radio, but it's cheap. So other expansions you could do, you could take a um, DS1307 <coughs> real-time clock, for example, plug that into the GPIOs. Probably not on the Who2, because it's all surface mount, but certainly on something like the AR150. Having a real time clock source on the device allows you to do interesting things with GSM. So you could use this to stream GSM decodes over to a more powerful system to go and maybe do something like cracking A51 if one was so inclined. Uh, There's also a package called Multimon. Multimon is a uh, well, it's not a package, you have to package it yourself, but Multimon is a tool that decodes lots of different frequencies and lots of different ranges. So you can pick up things like shipping, you can track ships that are going through the same way you can track your stuff in the sky. You can also do things like, uh, has anybody here ever heard of POCSAG? No? Okay, so POCSAG is the packet protocol that's used for pages. Um, if any of you guys have seen the little chunky things from the 90s where they have a little LCD display, and you ring a number and leave a message and the message goes out to the device and vibrate, that's how IC support calls used to be done. People still actually use them all across Europe. Um, in the UK, decoding POXAD is a criminal offence. I am not in the UK. I don't know about the laws in Greece, but that law doesn't apply everywhere. And in places where it hasn't applied, you get to see some really interesting pages. Because a lot of automated systems use them. You get everything from out printer messages to, I think the best one was, um, I saw a series of pages once about a woman who, and it appeared to be some sort of call out thing to a doctor, and it was like, this woman's panicking and all the rest of it uh, because her cat's not well, and um, you know, all this, all this panic and drama. And it's like, yeah, you know, uh, need to get an ambulance, fibrillate needed, all this sort of stuff, and then it's like, oh, it's her cat. But you also get a lot of automated systems putting stuff out as well. You could use a 4G dongle on a, on a device as well. Uh, so for, some, for something like the Hutu that only has one USB port, that's no good. But on other devices where you've got two USB ports, go and use a 4G dongle to go and stream the upload file for the NTP sync. So you have some processing and demodulation of decode on the device itself and then stream the content up. You're going to have a much better time than trying to stream the raw signals up. Um, and you could use a micro SD card for data logging. So that Hutu that I showed you isn't any good for that sort of stuff. But this one is a Hutu TripLink Mini that's also running open WRC. I think I've got like a camera firmware on here or something like that. Um, basically, this has a smaller battery and it has a little micro SD card slot <coughs> beside. So again, you can have it right to a micro SD card and just do the new one, then come and pick it up later on after it's died and replace it with something else. <coughs> so. To recap, um, these toys are all technically cyber weapons. They are all technically um, governed by the Wassenaar arrangement. We might be surprised, but um, they are, even though they're crap. And the reason for that is they can still cause damage to things. Um, and if you read between the lines with what I've been showing you, there are obviously cool things you can do with these bits of hardware. But hacking cheap hardware is a lot of fun, and um, just because you know, it's cheap doesn't mean that it's useless. So I was going to show a final toy, but I'm not. Um, sorry, I, I haven't actually got the kit with me, so there's no point in showing it to you. Um, but I'd like to thank uh, Adafruit, uh, without whom I would not be doing horrible things with electronics. Um, and Cryptor, who's a guy who wrote some of the some of the, some similar code for Wi-Fi jamming, which is where I got the idea from, and I've stole some of his code as well. Uh, I'd like to thank Greg and Olga for having me over, and also Costa and all the Portugal Con Con crew as well. So, thanks very much for having me. <laughs> Any questions at all? Yep. So, I did a similar talk to this at B-Size London, 
and then I pushed the code out, and then um, I wrote a blog post about it, and then my former friend Dar went and pointed Mark at it and said, so you remember that time in your MacBook? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me, it was him all along. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you shit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he found out um, last week, and apparently he's not very happy, but I'm unlikely to see him again. So. <laughs> Probably not if I'm around there. <laughs> any other questions? Any questions about any of the technologies that I've um, been checking? Okay. Okay. Alright, well, if you do have any questions, come and have a chat with me. I don't bite hard. And, um, <laughs> I'll be doing a workshop later on where I will actually show you how to compile your own OpenWRC firmware and push it on the device to do so. And I'll just walk you through the process that I go through. Um, so thanks very much for having me guys.